Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MRI Climate Talks. My name is Eri Saikawa, and I'm an Associate Professor of Environmental Sciences at Emory University. If you're like me, you might be thinking a lot about the link between Black Lives Matter movement and climate crisis. There is actually a very nice 21-day personal and professional development initiative for non-Black academics going on right now called Academics for Black's Black Survival and Wellness. And I wanted to encourage those of you that would be interested to participate. I think that for all we do, we need to be authentic allies to all the forces around to make the world a better place. And we need to be bringing in diverse voices to the table. The information is posted, uh, will be posted on the chat message and the website is called academicsforblacklives.com with four being the number four. This webinar series is made possible by our anonymous donor that supports our trip to the UN climate change negotiations and Emory Climate Talks is in partnership with the Department of Environmental Sciences and the Resilience and Sustainability Collaboratory at Emory University. Behind today's seminar was also Jennifer Fundora, uh, who is an Emory alumna and works at South Space Institute. And so I wanted to um, thank her for making this possible. Also, I would like to give a shout out, as always, to Leah Thomas, who does all the work behind the scenes and makes sure that these webinars are run well. And of course, I really would like to thank you all for coming to this seminar um, and obviously uh, for the speaker as well. We have so many great speakers coming up um, in the future talks as well. And so please check out our website, www.climatetalks.emorydomains.org slash webinars for future webinars. And please do also check out our YouTube channel for the past talks and subscribe as well. We are recording today's talk and we will make that available to you in the next couple of days on the YouTube channel. For the recording purposes, we have muted your microphone, but if you have any questions during the talk, feel free to use the chat function to type up the questions so that we can raise them during the Q&A. Um, without further ado, today I'm very excited that we have Mr. Jeff Foote from South Face Institute. Mr. Foote has a BA in Political Science and History from uh, State University of New York, Fredonia. Mr. Foote is a principal consultant at South Face Institute and he works on bit building. As many of you know, buildings are in charge of substantial amount of carbon emissions in the US and BIT is, a built, it, BIT is a program designed for facility operators to guide them in the implementation of performance improvements, including energy efficiency. Mr. Foote also works on Earthcraft, uh, which provides training to builders, realtors, and property managers that will enable the construction of properties that use 30% less energy. So I think this is such a great continuation of the discussion we started on sustainable building from last week. But it is also important to bring up that Mr. Foote has so many years of experience working on different issues, including circular economy, clean tech investment, and corporate sustainability strategy, refrigeration, and water stewardship. In addition to South Face Institute, he has worked for 20 years at the Coca-Cola company and has been consulting there as well. I can go on with all the other places that he has worked at before these jobs, um, but that will probably take up all the seminar time. Uh, so I will stop here and give him the floor so that we can actually hear from him directly about all the exciting projects that he has been a part of. So as I said, I will open up the questions after the talk. And so please jump in with any questions uh, during the talk. Uh, with that, uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us. And the floor is yours. Ari and Leah, thank you so much. And for everyone that's on the seminar today. I'm really glad that you're here. Quite a long time ago, I was sitting exactly where you guys are as a young person studying and trying to figure out what my impact was going to be on the world. And um, the reason I ended up having a, in my entire career being involved in environment and sustainability is because I got an 18 on a test. An 18, not, not out of 20, 18 out of 100. My dad was a banker and he had one of the very first handheld calculators called Bomar Brain in 1975. It cost about $500. And when I went off to SUNY Fredonia in uh, 1982, he gave that to me as a gift. And it was a pretty high tech calculator at the time. 
and I took statistics. And the very first test, I was all set, went in with my Bomar brain and turned it on and it didn't work. The battery had failed. And so I, I struggled through the test and uh, afterwards complained to the professor and he told me that I just was not prepared. And if I had been prepared, I, I would have done a much better job. And, um, so, and he wouldn't let me take it again. So I decided that I would take the class to the drop date and then take it the next semester from another professor. Well, I did that. And in, in, in the meantime, I bought this solar calculator. So this was bought in the early 80s and it still works and I use it almost every day. I took statistics the next semester with another professor named Dr. Dave Baker, who was really engaging, really interesting. And he had done his PhD research on a thing called Love Canal. And if you're not familiar with Love Canal, Love Canal is a neighborhood in the Niagara Falls area of Western New York. And during the 1940s, a company called Occidental Chemical Company, also known as Hooker Chemical Company, had buried thousands and thousands of 55 gallon drums on their property. Their property sat above an aquifer that was near a school and adjacent to a neighborhood. And from about 1978 to 1982, about 56% of the births from the, from the Love Canal neighborhood, the children had a birth defect. And they were able to figure out that this was a direct result of the dumping of these chemicals into the ground by Occidental Chemical Company. Dr. Baker brought this to the classroom and made, made statistics really relevant and really interesting to me. And it made me think that there's got to be a better way for business and commerce to operate. We've got to do a better job. And that really inspired me. And I ended up getting an internship my last semester in Washington, DC for a company that worked on recycling and energy, uh, excuse me, recycling and composting and, and general waste management. So that's kind of how I got started. What, a, what I'm gonna do in this discussion today is, is give you a little bit of a background with regards to climate change, some of the things that the wonderful organization that I work for, South Face Institute, is doing, and, and have a little chat about some of the things that you may add to your portfolio of personal and professional things you can do to reduce your impact on climate. So South Face, if you don't know about South Face Institute, been around since about 1978. The mission of the organization is to promote sustainable homes, workplaces, and communities through research, advocacy, and technical assistance. And it's a really great dynamic organization with about 60 or so people. Um, to give you a little bit more back, background on my professional background, uh, I worked as, as Ari said, for 20 years at the Coca-Cola company, and I got to do six or seven things I had no business doing. Wonderful thing about Coke is, in, in a lot of big businesses, um, if, if you're, willing to work hard and you look for white spaces where information or issues or risks aren't necessarily being addressed and you raise your hand and volunteer to fix them, you can get to do some pretty interesting things. I got to go to all seven continents more than once. In fact, I got to organize two trips to Antarctica. This is a chin strap penguin um, on King George Island in Antarctica. Uh, how do you get to put together a trip to Antarctica when you work for Coca-Cola? Well, I convinced the chairman that, uh, uh, that about 70% of the world's fresh water was in Antarctica. Water is the number one ingredient in everything Coca-Cola sells. If you wanted to um, see climate change firsthand, Antarctica is a, a terrific place to go. Amazing biodiversity. And also you can be under the hole in the ozone layer. Uh, I worked in the sustainability and environmental group at Coke. And I figured the best way to inspire staff from around the world was to get them down to Antarctica to see where all that amazing fresh water was and all these other environmental be beauty and, and risk. Um, climate change is real. Climate change is a big issue and climate change um, has, a, has a lot of causes. Um, on the right hand side of this screen is the Dominican Republic. On the left hand side of the screen is Haiti. In 1923, about 60% of Haiti had a beautiful tree canopy. Today, it's down to about 30%. 
Most of the trees have been deforested for fuel, for charcoal, for cooking, for heating of homes, um, and, and for agriculture. Haiti just doesn't have real good policies around um, deforestation. This picture to me is such a stark uh, example of what deforestation can do to, uh, to a place. The, in case you hadn't known, the World, Re World Resources Institute estimates that um, about 30% of the global forest cover has been cleared and 20% of that has been, been degraded. Um, we, we cut down about 15 billion trees every year. That's, that's an, incredible, an incredible number of trees. And deforestation accounts for between 10 and 20% of the global greenhouse gas emissions that take place um, on, on an annual basis around the world. And what, what scientists have figured out is with deforestation, uh, when you remove that canopy, you're, you're removing vegetation and cover, you're releasing greenhouse gases from that stored, that stored uh, biomass, um, and you're preventing forests from sequestering CO2. CO2 is what um, helps create um, uh, a forest. That's what they, they breathe, CO2. So um, it's amazing what happens with deforestation. And there's a really interesting um, quote that I've seen from a guy named Chuck Burr, uh, who's uh, founder of uh, the Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association. And he says, when you walk from a mature old growth forest, excuse me, when you walk from a, from a, um, from a modern forest that's been planted for agriculture, for, for, for timber and paper, when you walk from that and you walk into a mature old growth forest, the temperature is gonna drop about 10 degrees. The humidity is gonna increase 10% and the amount of oxygen is gonna increase a few percent. So although planting of trees is a really good idea, um, you really can't replace the benefits with regards to a mature natural virgin forest. Another big cause of deforestation is agriculture. It's the conversion of agriculture to, uh, to excuse me, trees to agriculture. It's about 50% of the cause of, of deforestation. And the big, big pieces are for beef, for timber, for paper, for, for, uh, for paper, for palm oil, and soy. Now, there's some, the, good, the good part is that there are some really good programs out there that are trying to certify agriculture and try to reduce the amount of agriculture that's having an impact on, on deforestation. But just um, think about this. Um, coffee grows um, in volume as far as consumption, about 2% a year. It requires about 100,000 hectares of additional forest to be cut down to plant new coffee plants to meet that growth. A pretty, pretty big chunk. Um, I said beef is a big cause of deforestation. So is soy. About 90% of the soy that's grown goes to feed beef, beef cattle for, for, for meat, and also for milk. Uh, if you went to uh, Starbucks and ordered a, uh, a coffee and got milk in it, what do you think the largest climate impact is? Is it the deforestation? Is it the growing of the coffee? Is it the processing of the coffee? Is it the making of the coffee at the shop? It's the milk that's added to the coffee is the biggest chunk of, 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 on climate change. Um, every day, we consume about 72 pounds of waste to fuel our American lifestyles. That's the material for our food. That's, that's the material that's used to make our clothing. That's the coal that's dug to make our electricity. It's an amazing amount of material, 72 pounds per person per day. And only about 9% of that is circular or reused again. You can see in this picture a gentleman that's, he's farming sugar cane. Now, if, let's say if that picture is one ton of sugar cane that he's harvest, when they break down that cane to make sugar for your coffee or your Coca-Cola, that one ton of sugar cane gets translated down to only about 265 pounds of sugar. So there's nearly a ton of waste material left over. And that's pretty typical of, of any product that we're buying. There's an amazing amount of 
waste that's generated. What our challenge is, is can we find uses for, for, for that material in the future for, for other things? Obviously another big cause of climate change is the use of fossil fuels. In fact, it is the largest emitter of CO2 pollution or greenhouse gases uh, in our atmosphere. It is, it is um, fossil fuels are probably 80% worldwide of the fuel for the energy that we use. And it produces quite a bit of, of, of that green, of the greenhouse gas, gases um, that do have an impact on climate. Um, the, the, the IPCC has, has done tons of research over the last 30 years or so to try to identify the, the historic impact since the start of the, the uh, Industrial Revolution today and the amount of CO2 that's now in the atmosphere and that's trapping those gases has, has really grown out of control. And we basically have about 11 years left um, for us to reduce our use of fossil fuels to really keep our our increase in temperature at one and a half or so degrees C above what it was about 150 years ago. Um, and right now, the, the level that we're consuming coal, gas, and oil, natural gas and oil, is, is, it a, is it a rate that's much, much higher than we'll be able to keep um, the level temperature at one and a half degrees. So there is a ton that we all need to do in our personal lives, in our business lives, to really reduce um, that impact on climate. Um, this is a gas pipeline that's in the western part of Georgia. Um, it, it's a very big company, and it's bringing a very useful product um, to us to fuel our cars. Um, but we've got to start to, to, to wean ourselves off, off of, of fossil fuels. Exciting, I read about this study that came out last week from UC Berkeley that's done um, economic research. And, and, and basically, today, if you're going to put new generation capacity out for generating electricity, if you use wind or solar, in most applications, it's going to be cheaper than coal. And in many applications, it should start, it is going to be cheaper than natural gas. Um, this study by, at Ber from Berkeley is saying that it's feasible for us to reach 90% clean electricity by 2035. So that's using uh, renewable resources to, uh, to, to create our electricity. So that's a really encouraging piece of work that, uh, that Berkeley's just come out with. Um, the key is we, we've got to start adopting this and that's probably one of the adopting more and more fossil fuels. And that's probably the, the toughest thing is that people don't like change and, and governments and businesses find difficult, it difficult to adopt, adopt change. I also want to point out that, that there is a, a nexus between water use and energy. About 54% of the water, urban water use in the United States is used for, is drinking water used for landscape irrigation. And 30 or 40% of that is, is, is wasted. About 20% of the water that's running through the pipes around the city of Atlanta leaks. Huge amount of, of waste of that water and all the energy that it takes to pump. The amount of energy that it takes to pump water around the world could be as much as 20% of all the energy that's used. So if we waste water for irrigation, if we waste water just having running toilets, we're wasting energy as well. Think about that. Wasting energy, wasting water results in wasting energy. So if you're able to save water at home and at work, you're gonna reduce energy use as well. When I was at Coke, one of the things I got to work on um, was uh, refrigeration. And we, I've talked here quite a bit about fossil fuels and deforestation as impacts of, um, on climate change. Uh, but there are other things too. There are other greenhouse gases. Uh, there's a greenhouse gas called hydrofluorocarbons. And if you have a car air conditioner, it's likely fueled by hydrofluorocarbons. An air conditioner in an apartment or a house is typically run on hydrofluorocarbons. And um, for quite a long time, that was what was used in refrigerators and vending machines by Coca-Cola to cool their equipment. What we had figured out um, 
at Coke with a little bit of help from Greenpeace, I apologize, you may hear some barking in the background, um, is that uh, hydrofluorocarbons are 1,300 times more impactful on climate than CO2. And, and what Greenpeace had, had figured out is that if the developing world was going to adopt lifestyles like the United States and, and Western Europe, that their increased use of refrigeration and air conditioning was going to explode. And this is, this is back in the, in the late 90s that they had figured this out. And so when they're doing that research and they had figured out that 1,300 times impact on, on um, climate of, of hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs, they realized that, boy, they've got to do something to cut that. Otherwise, it, there was going to be a real, real big issue. And they had figured out that there were natural refrigerants out there that could be used to reduce the impact on climate. In fact, CO2 uh, is a wonderful refrigerant, and that's climate change numbers one versus 1,300. Uh, but also helium can be used for refrigeration. Acoustics can be used for, for refrigeration, as can uh, butane or lighter fluid lighter fluid, all with a basically an impact of, of one or less on climate change. And so I was part of a, a small group of, of a dozen or so people at Coke that worked really hard leading up to the Sydney Olympics in the year 2000 to figure out a solution. And um, with help from Greenpeace and help from our suppliers and, and lots of smart engineers at Coke, we made a commitment to phase out of the use of hydrofluorocarbons for not only the, the refrigerant in the compressors, but also in the insulation. About 70% of the HFCs that are, that are used in a typical cooler was actually in, in the insulation. And so we phased that out. We worked to, com to convert new com uh, compressors and we worked to make the equipment 40 to 50% more energy efficient. So that's, this makes me really proud when, it, when I'm out shopping wherever it is in the world and I happen to see a Coke cooler and I know that that group of people along with uh, myself played a little role in, in getting Coke to phase out of the use of hydrofluorocarbons. Now we've got to get the rest of the world to do that. Um, uh, countries are just starting to recognize that as, as an issue and I'm hopeful that, that smart engineers at places like Emory and uh, Georgia Tech and elsewhere um, and Berkeley will we'll work to, to make the innovations to enable us to use natural refrigerants in our air conditionings for homes and, and cars. Um, another place that it's a huge impact on climate is, is food waste. Um, only about 30, excuse me, 30% 30 of what we grow around the world doesn't end up in our bellies as calories. It ends up being wasted in the field or at the restaurant in the grocery store at our, or at our homes. The largest component of waste going to landfills today is organic material, most of that being food waste. The way a landfill is designed, it's designed to uh, usually with every day, a bunch of dirt would get laid on top of the organic material. It's supposed to entomb the material so it doesn't break down quickly. And there's an absence of oxygen. And so when the material does break down, it creates methane. And methane gas is a very, again, a very potent greenhouse gas. It's about 28% times more impactful on climate than CO2. And so think about this rotting food waste creating all this methane that's, again, increasing our impact on climate. This is one of the really simple things that you can do, whether at home or, or um, at work, is to try to avoid food waste. And if you can't avoid it, look for opportunities uh, to compost that. And I'll have a little bit more on that in a, in a minute. Cities are a huge, huge focus of climate change. In fact, about 70% of the carbon emissions around the world come from cities. And a big chunk of that, and that, so that's cars, that's buildings, uh, that's all the equipment. Um, and, and unfortunately, so many of those buildings have already been designed and, and are somewhat limited in their ability for, for us to impact and reduce their, their footprint. There's lots we can do with new buildings. So they can be designed with environment in mind to reduce their impact. In fact, there are some buildings that are now net zero, a small handful, but lots of, lots of buildings are, can be 50 to 60 to 
more energy efficient going forward. But there are lots of opportunities that we can, we can implement within existing buildings as well. When uh, lighting goes, implementing um, LED lighting, when reno renovations happen, using um, more efficient materials, putting in better insulation, putting in better systems, uh, energy management systems can significantly reduce the amount of energy that it takes to operate a building. So that takes me to South Face. So what is South Face do? South Face is, is really focused in on, on the built environment, on helping with regards to climate, uh, reducing your energy use, and improving the quality of the air within, within uh, a building. If you've got, uh, if you're using um, materials that have lots of off-gassing, that can impact people's lungs and their, and their natural health. If you have um, uh, leaky pipes, you, that, that can impact people's health, asthma, those kind of things. And we try to combine the, the, the redesign and design of new buildings to move those materials out so you can have cleaner air and you can have, have it really more efficiently. There are a couple of programs that I'll, that I'll talk about briefly with regards that we're involved with at, uh, at South Face. The first is Earthcraft. And Earthcraft was started about in about um, 1999. And it's, it's a wonderful program that is designed to help architects, designers, and builders deliver a, a much more efficient building for single family homes, for multifamily homes, as, as well as uh, light commercial homes, and then historical re renovations. And uh, what we do is we provide the training for the builders and for the architects and the individuals that do the work to give them the, the right tools, the right instruction, so that they, when they go out and they build their new project, they should be able to deliver a structure, a building, a home, that's about 30% more energy efficient and about 30% more water efficient. And there are about, um, I think something like 80,000 structures that have gone through the Earthcraft program since it started back in 1999. Um, and it's, uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a place called Rhodes Hall uh, in Midtown, kind of over by SCAD. Uh, that's an example of a historic renovation that we've done where we work with uh, the owner of a historic building and as they're renovating and trying to preserve that building, build in sustainability and energy efficiency as part of it. The other program that I would mention is, is bit building. Um, I mentioned about all those buildings and their impact on climate. Once they're built, sometimes it's hard to do. What bit building is designed for is for the building operator, the, uh, the, the building supervisor to provide that person with training in about 16 best practice areas so they can improve the overall performance of the building. So we, the, the program's designed to help provide leadership and training, give instruction on how to do measurement and conduct audits, and to deliver best practice training in about 16 areas, including, including energy efficiency. And so organizations like Adobe and, and Google are participants of, of, of bit building. It's really, really inexpensive. And uh, any organization can sign their, their um, building manager up to get, uh, to get training in, in, in bit. Another program that we have um, that focuses on the built environment is good use. And good use is really trying to engage nonprofits a Boys and Girls Club, a um, Salvation Army organization. Those folks do wonderful, wonderful work, but typically they're not experts in sustainability or energy efficiency. What Good Use is designed to do is to go into a nonprofit, do an assessment of, of their, basically of their utilities and their operations and try to identify places where they can reduce energy use, help them identify programs where they can do um, equipment upgrades and really reduce their overall use. And then we'll help fund that. And then what happens is the savings that the organization benefits from off of their, their power bill and their utility bills, they can use that money 
to apply it to their to the to their programs. What a better use of their of their operational money. Reduce that cost on utilities and put it onto programs. So that's what good use does. And we have grant program um, and applications that happen. I think I think it's four times a year. And the next application, I believe, is due around in the October timeframe. My colleague Jennifer Fundora is on the phone, and she is an expert, and she's a co-coordinator of Clean Cities Georgia. She does a wonderful job, and in a nutshell, what Clean Cities Georgia is trying to do is try to engage fleet operators. So that's private businesses, that's that's government entities, it's nonprofits that have lots of vehicles, and to try to provide them with with uh, best practices and coaching and information to reduce their use of, of fossil fuels for their fleets, uh, give them instructions and things like idle reduction, um, and then also introduce them to alternative fuel opportunities that can essentially eliminate the, the emissions that come from, from fleets. If you look at um, um, a big organization, um, let's say like Coca-Cola, fleets are probably the third or so biggest impact on climate, but they have hundreds of thousands of fleets. So any place that they can get instruction and ideas and best practices on how to reduce that usage and then what the latest is, is happening in, in renewables um, can be very helpful. And that's really what Clean Cities Georgia is designed to, to, to do. It's, a, it's part of a, lot, a larger program from Department of, uh, of Energy. And Jennifer does a really good job um, uh, administering this program and giving great advice and, and support to organizations that have fleets that are trying to reduce that, that impact. So I'm going to wrap this up in the next couple of minutes and just point out a couple of things that, uh, that I can encourage you guys to do. So whether you, 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 you're living in an apartment or you're in an, you work in an office or um, you have a home, if you're generating food scraps, you can either compost them or you can do vermiculture that is going to reduce that waste impact um, from a methane standpoint by an amazing amount. About the, the reduction in waste. So if you, if you generate a, a hundred pounds of food waste a year, if you compost it, um, about 70% of that is water and that's going to evaporate. You're going to end up with about 30 pounds of stuff that makes really nice uh, soil amendment that you can put on your, uh, uh, on your garden, um, mix it in and grow some tomatoes. But I encourage you, if you're not um, composting food waste today, it is something that you can do even, even if you have a small balcony um, at, uh, in your apartment or, or um, vermicul vermiculture. And NC State is, uh, has got a great website on vermiculture, all the tips, how to build a, a bin, where to get the type, the type of worms um, that you need. There's a, a Dr. Rhonda Sherman, at NC State's got a wonderful program there. In fact, we did a bit, bit community call um, two weeks ago on, on vermiculture and composting. And that, that's actually on the bit building website um, that you can watch. Um, then reduce your energy use, look for opportunities to use renewable energy. I, I live in an area where um, I'm part of the, the, the um, EMC network. So Sony is, our, is my provider. And so I actually have an option for buying renewable energy from my provider. And the way they do it, it's, um, I think for every 150 megawatts of power that I buy is, is renewable, it's about uh, $3.50 each. So a typical monthly energy bill is about 500, uh, uses about 500 megawatts of, of energy. Um, excuse me, kilowatts of energy, 500 kilowatts of energy a month. Um, so for um, about $11, you could, you could have nearly 100% of your energy be, be renewable. My youngest son is a, is a senior at uh, Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. And when he moved into, when he was moving into his house um, a, a couple of months ago, for this semester, um, he found an option for the, the local electric provider in, in Fort Worth, Texas, that gave an option for them to buy renewable fuel as part of it. So there, there, there are programs out there that you can, uh, 
sign up for to, to buy renewable um, fuel for, for electricity and for natural gas as well. I believe some of the nat local natural, the local natural gas organizations do provide that. We, actually for our gas, we're, we're spending a little bit more every month, maybe three or four dollars a month to, to use landfill gas rather than uh, traditional get, uh, gas for our, for our heating fuel. Um, plant trees, there's lots of organizations out there that, uh, that for a very reduced amount of cost, you can, you can uh, uh, make a donation and, and have trees planted in your name. Um, one mature tree is gonna sequester about 40 tons of carbon over, over its lifetime. Um, planting a couple of trees a year can, can offset a, a whole big chunk of, uh, of your carbon emissions. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's an easy thing to do. Um, in fact, there are some organizations that when they measure their carbon footprint, when, they, when they're done doing all the efficiency things they can do, and they've installed some renewable, that leftover bit, they'll then engage with a local organization or international organization and buy carbon credits that often come from programs that, that are out there planting thousands and thousands of trees to sequester the, the carbon. Um, folks that are thinking about graduating soon and looking at the, um, the, the map around the world, around the US with regards to job opportunities, um, renewable energy is uh, one of the hottest jobs in places like California, uh, in Georgia, uh, Texas, and in lots of other states within in, in the South. So, Renewable energy is a growing area uh, uh, for, for jobs. Um, and if you really want to make a difference um, and reduce people's carbon footprint, that's, that there, there's a pretty good, uh, pretty good um, really some really good jobs in renewable energy right now. So I just wrapped it up and, and suggest the, the most impactful things that you can do with regards to reducing your carbon footprint. Um, the, the most efficient energy is no energy at all. So megawatts, reducing it, don't use it if you don't have to, that's turning out lights, that's unplugging your computer when you're not using it. Um, that's that's um, trying to be as efficient as possible. I mentioned the opportunity to buy renewable energy um, uh, as part of your, your power bill, plant trees, carbon offsets. Um, your diet is a, is a huge thing. Um, if you have a, a pretty heavy uh, keto beef diet, you're going to have a, a, a bigger impact than someone who um, eats uh, very little meat uh, or is a, a vegetarian or a vegan. So uh, really something that you can think about doing. And then um, something that's really interesting is uh, this ESG investing. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a growing focus area. Lots of universities are starting to look at what their investments are and what they're invested in and trying to, to, to move out of investments that are related to things like fossil fuels, um, um, or oil, and, and so on and so forth. And I, I, I should have said this earlier, congratulations to, to Emory and the, I guess back in May, you announced a, a pretty big, I think 14,000 solar panel announcement on, on a whole bunch of 14 year buildings or something like that. That's fantastic. I think it's gonna get 10 or 12% of your peak energy use. Um, so, so good on you for, for, for doing that. And activism, how you purchase things, and getting out and voting. That's, that's, those are really key things you can do to, that ultimately help reduce your impact on climate. I've been talking a lot. I'm going to take a breath and be happy to, to answer any, uh, any, any questions people may have sent in. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, on behalf of everybody, I would like to clap. Um, that was very informative. I'm actually getting uh, uh, a question to my private chat. Um, please feel free to um, chat to everybody um, if you have any questions or you can uh, chat to me as well. But I would like to start off with the question that I received. So Mohammed is asking, when it comes to designing an environmental friendly building, since the ultimate goal is to have an efficient neighborhood, does your platform consider the interaction between some sustainable buildings or is it just design them individually? As an example, imagine that we have a permeable material for capturing the rainfall and use it as a water resource. What would be the impact of capturing the water from the first couple of buildings in the neighborhood on the other buildings? 
that may not have the opportunity of capturing any water since all of the water has been captured. Or many other examples which show the importance of network design when it comes to sustainable buildings. Yeah, I think that's great systems thinking. Great, the, the, the idea of thinking in, in a more network standpoint is gonna deliver much, a much bigger bang for your buck. The Earthcraft Communities Program, which is part of our Earthcraft delivery uh, of, of projects, does have that community aspect that's gonna try to look beyond just one, one building. Um, but most of the, the work that we're doing with regards to BIT and to Earthcraft are one building at a time. Um, and and um, on the BIT side, it's already existing buildings. So it's, it, it can be difficult to network, but we do try to work with organizations that have multiple buildings and hoping that they'll make changes that, that can be connected and, and copied by other buildings. But um, I think it's, it's, it's a big design challenge, um, but the, 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 a, a big way for us to reduce the overall impact is for us to take a community approach. Uh, we do some work, we're, we're doing some work um, in Athens, Clark County to try to take more of a community approach to things. Uh, we're getting ready to do some work as a sub to uh, uh, the community that I live in, in uh, Milton, Georgia. And we're doing some work um, in, uh, in Sarasota County, Florida. It, it's more broader. So um, we do some of that work. Yeah, so just to follow up on that, in order to do, have this kind of a system design at the community level, what do we need to do um, to work on that? Like, do we need the city? Do we need different stakeholders, I guess. Um, yeah, you, you, we, we definitely need to engage um, the city, but community leaders, um, organizations that are um, uh, influential in that community. And um, you make me think of, of um, economic development agencies um, within a city, a county, within, or, or within a state to try to work with them as well. That, um, uh, in fact, we're, we're trying to outreach to uh, the state of Georgia's economic development authority as they're trying to recruit new businesses into Georgia on big plots of land that they've, they've identified. We're hopeful that, we're, that we can work with, with them with regards to, to Earthcraft, hopefully, to get an entire development focused in on a systems approach opposed to just one-offs for a few buildings. But yeah, I think you have to engage the, the local government, um, organize big influential businesses and, and uh, community organizations. And I guess you can, um, so is there also a collaboration going on for connecting the buildings, the transportation, the food, like all that you talked about for one community to do all that together? I, I can't give you an example of one that, that's connecting all of them. Um, I'm, I'm sure there probably are some. Um, and, you know, certainly the city of Atlanta is trying to um, look at uh, every piece of the city's impact on climate and setting, I think there's over 100 cities now that have set a 100% a renewable energy goal for, for the community. And so that, that's when you set a big challenge. Uh, like that, that I think that's that's one one way to sort of get lots of people to start focusing and thinking about well, how do you deliver on that? Right, and then thinking about circular economy as well. Um, okay, another uh, I, I guess I shouldn't dominate. So I, <laughs> another question came. So um, this is asking, how do you feel about Naomi Klein's notion of capitalism versus the climate? Do you think that the green solutions that a publicly traded company like Coca Cola employs our employees are inherently band-aids on a much larger problem of, of corporations requiring an infinite growth on the finite planet, planet. How can corporations be responsible to the planet when their business model mandates being responsible to their shareholders? Um, so my experience with Coke is that uh, sustainability is definitely a journey, not a destination. Back in January, James Quincy, who's the CEO of the company, reset the company's purpose and moved the purpose a bit away from just delivering share owner value. When I joined the company in 1996, it was all about delivering share owner value. Um, now that the, the focus of the business, the purpose of, of Coca-Cola is to refresh the world and make a difference. And that, um, so it's, 
refresh the world. They're, they're a beverage company. They're, they're delivering hydration. They're delivering a moment of happiness to people, but they're trying to do it in a way that makes a difference. So I think that that's really, uh, really key. Um, changes that a place like Coke that's all over the world, um, uh, incrementally, the, I'm really proud of the work that I was involved with with regards to HFCs. Um, we were the first ones to do it. It took governments to address HFT. It didn't start addressing HF, HFCs for, until 15 years after what Coke did. So that's an example where Coke was way ahead of, of basically any other, other company and, and certainly major governments around the world. Um, it's not to say that company, there aren't more things that companies can do. And one of the emerging things that's, hap that's happening right now that I think that can be very helpful is this concept of a B Corp. So an organization that goes through and, and does the, the B impact assessment and basically assesses itself against perfection in the areas of environment, community, uh, employee relations, customers and, and overall governance. And um, those companies that then take that assessment and decide then to become B certified, those companies um, ultimately, once they're certified, look to change their corporate charter. And their, their charter now is not just about sharing value, it's about providing value to their employees, to their community, to the environment, to their customers. And so I think that it, it's, it's constructs and guidance and certifications like B Corp that, that take a really holistic approach that, that I think are gonna deliver really what we need. Certainly companies can do it without being B Corp, but that, I think that's a, an emerging trend that I think really can, can, can help. Yeah, it's, it's very, um, I think, what I, uh, I wanted to ask you was, in order to go into the circular economy, um, there must be um, some solutions that have to come from big companies like Coca-Cola. So what do you think is another step that the Coca-Cola or other companies can take um, to move us forward mm -hmm. and then where individuals can also push together? There are a couple things. I think that it's, so if, if a person that works for, for a big company if they're in marketing, whatever they're selling, um, they really should understand where the raw, ma raw materials and ingredients come from. Are they coming from Thailand? Are they coming from South Africa? Are they coming from Mexico? Are they coming from Nebraska? And what does it take to get there? What, what's the impact on, on the energy? How much, how much um, sugar cane are they growing to make? How much sugar to, to be as an ingredient in that product and what is the waste along the way. So getting the marketing people to actually go out to the field and see this, having the procurement people do the same thing to, to really understand their impact, I think is really important for them to, to understand it. Um, eat what you grow is I think what Walmart used to call it. And they, would, they were particularly good at this for their, for their company owned brand. So the person that was the brand owner for their cottage cheese actually had to go to dairy farms and take a look at how the dairy farm operated and realize that there was an enormous amount of methane that was coming from the feeding and the digestive issues with the cattle. And so what, what influence could that brand manager for their, their home, home, their Walmart brand cottage cheese, what could they do? Um, and when they engage their supply chain, when they go and, and look for for uh, better ways to do that, they can make a they can make a big a big difference. Another area that I would say where there's a bit of a disconnect is in a big company. Big companies usually have a procurement arm, um, uh, where they've got these really well trained business people that that really know how to go out and and, and buy um, goods and services and products and equipment at, at a really good price. That are, that are really high quality and meet the specifications for their business. And they're usually incentivized by going get, getting the best price. Where the disconnect happens is they'll go out and buy a piece of equipment, spend a bunch of capital on it, save a bunch of money, um, but then they're, they're not connected with the person that actually then operates that piece of equipment and has to fuel it over time. And then that person's not usually connected with the person that actually has to maintain um, or repair that piece of equipment 
And then there might even be a fourth bucket of the, the person whose budget it goes on when they have to get rid of that thing. And so when you take more what I would call a life cycle assessment, what is all of the inputs from an energy, water, waste standpoint that goes through that entire process from raw ingredient all the way through what happens when I'm done with this at the end, mm -hmm. you're gonna make some different decisions. And so that procurement person may go out and buy, spend more money on a piece of equipment because it lasts 30% longer or uses 50% less fuel or doesn't, use a, it doesn't have a toxic emission piece. And when we start doing that life cycle look, that can really make, that can really make a big difference. Um, I would say though, we're only scratching the surface on circular economy and on the life cycle impact. We're, 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 at, we're at about, we're not even at 18 where I scored on that stats test. We're probably at a 10 or a 12 on that. And that, that's for just about every business around the world. So there's huge opportunity there. Um, what do you suggest the students or uh, uh, like individuals like us do in order to push uh, for circular economy? Um, is there some material that you suggest um, that we study or is there any hmm. good case study that we can learn from? Um, well, Aries, I had mentioned, there, you know, um, Omar Rodriguez, who's a professor at Emory, has done mm -hmm. some really good work on um, uh, social purpose for, for businesses. And so to take a look at his research, and a couple years ago, he had, a, he had an article that was done in the, the Harvard Business Review. And I know he's published some other work since then. So that, that would be one thing that I would take a look at. Um, I would take a look at, for a local company, Interface Carpet. Interface has uh, done a really good job across their entire business to reduce their impact on climate and to improve recyclability. They're, they're, they're now trying to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it in, embed it into their product to reduce their impact on climate. Um, they're trying to take the carpet, carpet squares that they, that they sell and lease and bring them back and use them as raw material to make new ones. So that's a good, a good case study um, to take a look at is, um, is that company. Those are, those are, that would be another example that I'd, I'd take a look at. Um, yeah. But, you know, but individually, what can you do? Take a look when you're, when you're buying things. Um, try to do reusables. Try to do um, stuff that can be, is made from renewable material. Um, stuff that's made from high levels of recycled content. Yeah, that's All great. those things are, are, are important. And then do you have any advice for um, your, like the career perspectives based on what you've done? Um, so if you want to work in sustainability, um, I think there's some opportunity out there, um, both in nonprofits, in government, and, and, in, and in, uh, in business. But if you're a marketing person, if you study marketing or you study engineering, you study chemistry, you study anthropology, um, that doesn't mean that you can't have it in, and, you, and you go in that track within to a business or you, you go into procurement or you go into marketing or whatever it is. Um, you can still have impact on sustainability in your organization. You don't have to have that as a title. Um, there's, a, a, there's a person that I know that graduated maybe a year or so ago from University of Georgia. Uh, she's a business person. And she works for a local Atlanta-based, big Atlanta-based company. And she organized their green team. She wanted to, she got the sustainability certificate in Georgia. Um, and she has tons of passion around it. And she's brought it into her job and has organized her colleagues to bring in outside speakers, to increase the recycling in, uh, in their office and, and look for other opportunity, opportunities to, to reduce their impact. So, um, you, you, you can volunteer and, and, and do things at work. And then also support, uh, get involved in, in local organizations that are doing things. So, you know, there's um, lots of organizations that recover food, edible food for, for the hungry. There are organizations that, that promote recycling. There are organizations that, that promote um, energy efficiency. Maybe volunteer for, for one of those groups. 
That's great. Join South Face. I think our 20, is it, I think it's $50 a year for students. Um, we'll give you tons of education and information um, with regards to things that we're, we're, we're involved in. Um, you'll learn a lot. We've got, uh, we, we've got some training programs um, uh, on efficiency that, uh, that people, some free, some, some per charge. But take, take a look at our, look at our website. South so East it's a student work. membership? Yeah, we do have a student membership. Yeah, that sounds great. So are there virtual events that they can go on to right now, potentially? Yeah, so um, the third Friday of every month, I have a bit call that's open and free for folks. And we do a different, different best practice um, every month. They, and uh, on, on bitbuilding.org, you should be able to find recordings from the last three or four. One's on composting, there's one on water leaks, there's one on green purchasing. So um, all those are free. We have um, a program called SART, and I believe that's the first Friday of every month from 7.30 to nine, that's a free program. And every month we have different, uh, different outside speakers. I think it's October 3rd is one that I'm hosting on, on B Corp. We're gonna have a couple of B Corps from Georgia on talking about B Corp. And I'll talk a little bit about a couple of the brands that I work with at Coke that uh, are pursuing B Corp certification. Oh, that's a lot of uh, great information. Thanks for that. Sure. Um, it seems like people have been very shy today, um, but I'm not seeing so many questions anymore. So I wanted to thank Jeff again. Thank you so much for this. Oh, there is a, um, yes. So there is a comment saying, thank you so much for speaking today and connecting a broad variety of topics environmental science, the work you've done with Coke and continue to do with the South Face Institute. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I totally agree. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. I don't want to take up too much of the, your time. So um, I wanted to just, um, I just sent out the future webinar series information. There's a lot coming up. Um, so please check out our website. Um, next one is going to be next Monday um, at 3 p.m. And we will be sending some of the links that we weren't able to um, send on the chat in the newsletter as a follow up. So thank you so much again, Jeff. And thank you so much, everybody. And um, stay safe and healthy. <laughs> we will see you next week. Terry, thank you very much. And thanks for everybody that was on. Really enjoyed it. I hope I didn't go too fast. No, that was great. Great pictures as well. Thank you so much. It's, you know, if you give great, uh, great presentation, then they cannot really ask you questions because it was way too clear. <laughs> well, all the pictures are mine except for the, um, the Haiti Dominican Republic one. Oh, I see. That Jennifer was, worked uh, on that. You knew that? What's that? Jennifer worked on that issue. She, I didn't know she did. Oh, yeah, that's fun. I'll have to ask her about that. Yeah, it's brilliant. Okay, thank you so much. Well, Ari, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That was great. Thank you. And if people ask other questions, feel free to flip them to me and I'll, I'll do my best to try to respond. Sounds great. Really appreciate it. Sure. Okay. Okay.